on planet Earth. Life has thrived for millions of years. Creatures big and small have found ways to adapt and evolve to flourish in all types of environments. From barren wastes to lush forests, life can be found. Earth has homed these creatures since the dawn of life itself. Only until very recently, things have changed. New life forms have appeared all around the globe and completely changing the balance of nature and what we know about evolution itself. That is why we, at National Living Meat Research, have been studying these new species, trying to help educate everyone about these creatures and their wondrous ways of life. First, what are these new life forms? Since their explosive arrival across the globe in 1931, there has been much debate on what these newcomers are, and where they came from. Are they extraterrestrials coming to invade Earth? Or are they demons who come from hell to purge humanity? From what our scientists have discovered, no. The origins of these creatures are solely to Earth, miraculously out of nowhere. We don't know why or how, but one thing is for certain, Earth is now their home. What these creatures are is mysterious and still not well known today. But here is what we do know. These creatures are comprised mainly of muscle tissue, organs, and bones. They greatly resemble animals with no skin, or store-bought meat. Because of these characteristics, they have been named accordingly as, Vita Carnies. The Carnies species consume decaying, organic matter, but their main diet is composed of raw meat, not including their Carnies relatives. The carnies only appear in places where there is an abundance of crawl, which leads to the first creature of the carnies species, the crawl. The crawl is a growth of meaty tendrils that closely resemble the small intestine, the only difference being the dark red coloration. These tendrils grow in a similar pattern as vines, mold, or fungi. A primary stem structure is the host to divisions of other, smaller branches, in each tendril contains a variety of veins, arteries, and other similar organs used to transport nutrients absorbed from its surroundings. The ends of these tendrils are equipped with organelles used to absorb water, and organic matter necessary for growth. The source of these organic materials is mainly found in dirt and soil on surrounding surfaces. Using its root-like tendrils, it absorbs the material and processes it into usable energy. Although, the crawl also obtains energy through another means. Using a sophisticated form of photosynthesis, the dark pigmentation of the smaller branches is ideal for absorbing sunlight, and therefore allowing solar energy to fuel the crawl's growth. Because of its efficiency, it thrives in almost all types of environments, easily allowing it to spread across the world, and can be found pretty much anywhere. Its recent inclusion in the ecosystem has caused many major changes in nature's balance. One may assume that the crawl's presence may outcompete any other competitors, but due to its unique life cycle, where old branches fall off and decay into nutrient-rich compost, all forms of life seemingly flourish instead. The crawl's abundance grants plenty of nourishment to all animals, from plants feeding on the decayed crawl, herbivores thriving on increased plant population, and carnivores feeding on both the abundant prey, and are able to eat the crawl as well. The presence of all these animals leave behind waste, which will be broken down and consumed by the crawl, and the cycle begins again. This form of symbiosis leads to an environment where all populations thrive. Humanity also uses the crawl to our advantage. Because of the supernatural rate of growth, and its richness in nutrients, it has been sustainably cultivated into domestic farms. The crawl is harvested and processed into fertilizer, which greatly increases crop yield and quality. The crawl may also be used as a food source for humans, and reliably so. But due to its unkindly appearance and taste, it has yet to reach cuisine standards. The crawl also plays a very important role in the next creatures that we have been studying. Sometimes, in a crawl populated environment, a node of meat may develop on one of the branches. This node will fall off and grow into a functioning organism, and go to live on as an independent animal. 
This leads us to the upcoming species that we will be discussing. The first of these creatures are, the trimmings. The trimmings. Trimmings are small animals that resemble skinned raccoons. They are commonly known to have a plump body, round head, small eyes, nose and ear holes, and an agape mouth. They are also equipped with a diversity of limbs. All individual trimmings are unique, each with a different body shape, number of limbs, and other characteristics. One thing they all share in common is that they are made mostly of meat tissue, and are a maximum of 20 centimeters in length, no larger than a basketball. Its life starts with its separation from the crawl. It will wonder to find anything that is edible and able to consume. Although it is an omnivore, being able to hunt meat and forage for plant matter, trimmings are almost entirely scavengers. Their diet consists of rotting plants and meat, including, but not limited to, fruits, vegetables, roots, seeds, insects, and deceased animals. Although its appearance is unsightly, it is a cowardly creature, only fleeing, screeching, and hiding when threatened. Because of its lack of defensive traits, it lies near the bottom of the food chain, making it easily overpowered and picked off very regularly by predators. Naturally, its population would eventually die out, but this is not the case. The crawl constantly produces a large quantity of trimming nodes, keeping up their numbers. Naturally, trimmings can be found wherever there is abundant crawl. Trimmings grow at a decent pace, reaching maturity at around 7 months, having a maximum lifespan of 2 to 4 years. Although they are plentiful, humanity has no proper way to implement trimmings into society. Their overabundance has even considered them pests, due to them digging through trash bins and making excessive noise at night. Besides all of this, some people still keep trimmings as pets, and relatively domesticate them. Nuisance or not, trimmings are a wondrous creature, from their plentiful numbers, to their skittish nature, they are truly a thing to behold. The next species on our list is, the meat snake. The meat snake. The meat snake is a worm-like creature, made of a variety of types of meat, coated in a transparent, skin-like membrane. Its size varies during its lifespan, depending on how much it consumes. When it first separates from the crawl, it is only a few centimeters in length. Eventually, it will reach an average length of 5 meters. Although, under extreme conditions, like natural disasters, war, or plague, it can greatly surpass this length. The meat snake's diet consists entirely of dead animals or parts. A meat snake is incapable of consuming a healthy, living organism. The meat snake allocates its food by using a tongue-like organ covered in sensors, to touch and feel its environment. The sensors catch particles of decaying meat, notifying the meat snake that there is food nearby. This process shares many similarities to regular snakes, hence the meat snake's name. Once it locates the corpse, the meat snake will open its jaw and swallow the entire body whole. Once the entire body is consumed, the meat snake's stomach will release a variety of chemicals. Some will break down soft tissue like skin, and the connection points between muscles. Others chemicals will then ferment and preserve the tissue to keep it from breaking down for as long as possible. After that, the remaining flesh and bones will move along the meat snake's tract and slowly be implemented into its own structure, extending the meat snake. Unsatisfactory parts like skulls, pelvises, hair, and fingernails will be excreted. Speaking of skulls, the meat snake will take the skull from the consumed organism and use it as its own. Each meat snake has its own skull, each corresponding to what that one has consumed. During its lifespan, it will swap or replace these skulls if needed. A meat snake's lifespan depends entirely on how much a meat snake consumes. The longest one has lived for was 28 years. The meat snake has no predators and is immune to disease, due to its preserving chemicals. The only significant ways a meat snake can die is through starvation, burning, 
or complete destruction of the meat snake's membrane coating. Interestingly, the meat snake is the only member of the Carnies family that is able to reproduce. When a meat snake reaches an excessive size, and is in the conditions to do so, it will commence mitosis, splitting itself in two, then the now two meat snakes will go on their separate ways and live on as two distinct organisms. Meat snakes can only be found in moderate temperature climates, not too hot, not too cold. Their population depends entirely on the amount of corpses available. Where there is death, there are meat snakes. Humanity will use them to our advantage. Meat snakes are a very efficient and clean way of disposing of any meat products. The preserving fluid within the meat snake's body disinfects the carrion, preventing the spread of disease. Humans use meat snakes in butcher shops as a waste bin, dispose roadkill, within war on the battlefield to dispose of festering bodies and parts, and within zoos to dispose of deceased animals. They are extremely tame, not caring if any creature is around them, only acting defensively when it is within consuming a meal. This means they are very easy to tame. Overall, meat snakes are a marvelous creature with a very interesting way of sustaining itself. It is an amazing experience to encounter one, as long as you don't mind the smell. Our next creature is, the Mimic. The Mimic. The Mimic is a bipedal creature with uncanny similarities to humanoid anatomy. They greatly resemble humans without skin, with added exaggerated features. These features include, extended finger length, longer limbs, bulging, empty eyes, and their most prominent feature, a wide, teeth-filled smile. Although it resembles a happy face, this is due to coincidence, and is only how their facial structure is shaped. The maw of the mimic contains much more teeth than humans, and their teeth is comprised almost entirely of incisors, with some canine and premolars in the back. This is tooth composition is ideal for biting down onto meat, and swallowing chucks whole. A mature mimic's diet is comprised entirely of human flesh. Because of this they are found solely around human populated areas. The mimic's life cycle is made of three stages. In the first stage, a young mimic separates from the crawl. They closely resemble their trimming relatives, but are thin, sleek, and only have four appendages. In this stage, the young mimic will hunt small animals, moving on to larger and larger as they grow. Once large enough, it will begin metamorphosis into the next stage of life. Once fully transformed, it will resemble the description mentioned in the beginning. Its hunting style changes and becomes much more complicated. It now stalks and feeds only on humans. It will locate human populated area and begin its search for an easy target. To blend in, it may use objects to conceal itself. These include clothing, mannequins, and furniture. Once a target has been found, the mimic will observe its prey and learn its routine and when it is most vulnerable. This is typically when the human is asleep at night. Once the prey is within position, the mimic will advance silently until it is close enough. The mimic will then execute and immediately begin consumption. Once the mimic has had its fill, it will leave the scene, a fair distance away from the human population, and begin to digest its meal. Although, in the case that a human is awake, a mimic will use a variety of sounds to either lure or startle prey into cornering themselves. Once a human is in place, it will swiftly attack and kill the helpless target.
The next stage of the mimic's life cycle has two potential morphs it may develop into. If a mimic has a consistent supply of food, it will develop more human-like features. It will grow skin, hair, and by the end will look nearly identical to a human being. It now can blend entirely into civilization, and lure other humans more effectively. The second type of morph happens when a mimic receives an overabundance of food. It will grow into a larger, more evolved hunter. Its proportions will increase in length, and its humanoid features will fade away. It grows a thick, dark coating of a flexible skin, which is highly durable, and increases in strength the more the elder mimic consumes. This excludes the face, which is now coated in a pale pink skin. The mimic's teeth have also moved deeper into the mimic's throat, leaving its mouth a toothless grin. It uses the dark hue of its skin to hide seamlessly within a dark environment. Its skills have also been heightened. This makes an elder mimic one of the most efficient predators on the planet. Because of the obvious threat this poses on humanity, nations around the world have released instructions on how to be able to fend for yourself in a mimic encounter. Here are the instructions. 1. Avoid going out alone if your location is known to have mimics, or there have been mimic sightings. 2. If you encounter a stationary mimic, seemingly unfazed by your presence, quietly leave the location and alert your local authorities. 3. If pursued by a mimic, get yourself into a position where you are able to flee. Mimics will rarely attack if a person has a clear escape route. 4. In the event that you have been cornered by a mimic, roll into the fetal position, protecting your neck, face, and vital organs from attack. Make as much noise as you can to alert any other people. 5. If you have a weapon, do not use it. A mimic is fairly resilient, and any strikes or shots on a mimic is not effective enough to bring it down in time. Instead, use it as a barrier between you and the mimic to block any attacks. 6. In a situation where a mimic is hunting in the immediate area, and is not aware of your position, hide somewhere low, like under a bed or behind other furniture. A mimic will not linger too long to search for prey, and will move on. Be safe, and avoid any encounters with a mimic at all costs. Next up, the Harvester. The Harvester. The Harvester is a large, bulbous mass, with a large amount of tendrils spreading from the base. The bulb measures around 3 meters in height and 2 meters in diameter. The tendrils, on the other hand, can extend up to 150 meters in diameter horizontally. The harvester is a specialized form of crawl that grows in a unique and deadly way. A harvester is created when a node, that will grow into a harvester, instead of separating, continues to grow. Eventually, it will grow tendrils of its own. It uses the energy provided by its mother branch and expands its reach further, its tendrils, hidden just below the surface of the ground. The harvester is equipped with two types of specialized tendrils. The first type is bulky, and flat. They lie the closest to the surface. These branches are lined on each length of the tendril with spines, extending in the shape of a bear trap. On each side of the branch, those particular spines have a vein that feed into them, that pump two types of venom. On one side, the spines can inject a neurotoxin, which will attack the nervous system of whomever it is injected into, causing sudden paralysis. The other side can inject an anticoagulant, which when injected, prevents blood cells from clotting. Whenever a large animal moves across the area armed with these tendrils, the branches will clamp onto the animal and thrash violently. Once the prey has been injected with both venoms, the tendrils will rest and the prey will immediately collapse. The animal will be unable to move due to the paralysis, and the wounds caused by the thrashing spines will not stop bleeding. All the prey can do is lie patiently, until succumbing to blood loss. Once the prey has bled out, the second type of tendrils come in. They lie below the spine equipped once, 
These branches are thick, but very sturdy. They share similar anatomy to the small branches of the crawl, equipped with organelle that absorbs nutrients. These tendrils sense the blood, and move their way to the surface and begin to absorb the vital fluid. Once the blood has been consumed, the tendrils will wrap around the body and begin to shuffle downwards. This movement loosens the soil and slowly pull the body underground. Once secure, the tendrils will continue to feed until there is nothing but scraps. The nourishment absorbed by the tendrils will be sucked back into the main bulb of the harvester. This bulb houses all the vital organs and the venom glands that pump into the spines. The nutrients are then converted into usable energy. The remains underground decompose, providing a rich soil, causing very prominent plant growth, which then attracts more animals. A strange behavior the harvester displays is its choice of diet. The spines will only activate on larger animals, allowing smaller ones to pass by unaffected. The spines will also not activate on some species of bird. There are a couple theories as to why this happens. One, it could be that attacking smaller animals would cost too much energy for what they get in return, making it not worth the time. Another, could be that smaller animals may attract larger animals or predators, allowing a safe place where prey may thrive, and lure more predators. It truly is astonishing. Although it is a spectacular creature, it is also very dangerous. The harvester is decently rare, only populating sparse areas in the northern hemisphere and woodland forests. If you are stunned by a harvester, there will be no way of helping you, being that there is no cure, and fatality is 100% positive. The best thing you can do is avoid encountering a harvester in the first place. If you are hiking, take note of any warnings or signs saying that there are harvesters around. If you also notice an abundance of lush, ground-dwelling plants in a forested area, and there are no signs of wildlife, this is suspicious and you should leave the area, staying close to the base of large trees or rocks. If you find yourself in the middle of a harvester ground, do not panic. Sudden movements may activate the tendrils and will inject you. Although a harvester is rather forgiving, do not risk any skittish movements. Remain calm. If you have any objects with considerable heft, like coats, backpacks, or full water bottles, gently take that object and lightly toss it towards the bulb, and away from your escape route. This will activate the spines on where the object lands, distracting the bulb for a moment. You will then slowly begin to do wide shuffles away from the bulb. If possible, throw another object when you are certain you are a fair enough distance away, just to be safe. Continue until you are completely sure you are out of harm's way. You may come out unscathed, but don't be too obnoxious, or you will be a harvester's next meal. Next up is... The Host. The Host of Influence. The host of influence, more commonly referred to as, the host, has its name derived from a host who invites guests to an event. Not to be confused with a host, a harborer of parasites or disease. The host is a semi-humanoid looking organism. It has the structure of a head, torso, and arms. Other than this, it shares no other characteristics. The lower half of the host is comprised of a mass of fibrous tissue and tendrils, that burrow into the ground to hold the host in place. Instead of skin, the host is covered in muscular tissue fibers, tendons, and veins. In some parts of the body are covered in a meaty plate, used to cover any large exposed areas, but allowing movement. The host's head has a smooth surface where the face should be, attached to a crooked neck which houses a slit in the front used for feeding. On the host's back, is a mound of pores. Protruding from these pores are a hollow, hair-like structures, extending outwards. These hairs are barrels that release spores produced within host's body, by being fired into the air. These spores are hazardous, so keep clear of them at all costs. Luckily, the host is rare, only found in North America, Obtaining info about the host is a very risky, and daunting task. 
This is because of their rarity and of how dangerous it is to be up close to one. The sores released by a host is very dangerous when inhaled. A host will release a cloud of spores into the air, which will be picked up by wind and carried great distances. If an organism inhales the spores, the particles will find their way into the organism's brain and infect them. An infected organism will show no symptoms of infection right away, but a couple hours after infection the infected organism's behavior and thought process will change. The first symptoms that appear are restlessness, sluggish movement, numbness of joints, and lack of coordination. Then more serious symptoms appear over time. These include dizziness, migraines, impaired speech, and trembles. If you or someone you know show these symptoms, contact poison control or emergency services. After a total of six to seven hours after infection, the organism will cease all activities they were previously doing and begin to walk. The direction the infected will walk is towards the host whose spores have been inhaled by the infected individual. If the infected makes their way to the host, they will kneel down in front of it, expose their vital organs, and the host will promptly gut and remove those organs. The host will consume them and discard the leftover scraps. However, if an infected organism doesn't reach the host within a 36-hour span or is treated for their infection, the effects will wear off and return back to normal. If a host is unable to find prey or doesn't like its current location, it will unroot itself and move to a new location. Their scarce numbers and the hazard of being around one, makes getting info about the host very daunting. All you need to currently know is that the host is extremely dangerous, and should be avoided at all costs. Next, the monoliths. The monoliths. The monolith is a very new creature, only showing up in June of 1972, in the area of There are only seven monoliths, all of them located in a circular position, one and a half kilometers in diameter. This ring of monoliths surround The monolith is a titanic-sized being, measuring roughly 120 meters in height. Each monolith has two trunk legs that are firmly embedded underground, the legs connect to a torso. The creature itself is made of hundreds of thousands of meaty strands, tightly woven together to form the structure. These strands end at the neck, fusing into a solid mass of hardened flesh in the shape of an upside-down triangle, with a hole in its center. On each side of the monolith where arms would be, there are dozens of long, rope-like appendages, these reach just barely to the ground. At the creature's feet, the strands go deep into the earth and extend horizontally a decent distance away. What the monoliths do is simply stand and do nothing. The only activity documented that the monoliths have done was in During this period, they were extremely aggressive. When the group of were making their way to the city, the monolith that they had passes roared a deep bellow and the swung its appendages at the team, completely wiping them out. When military vehicles were dispatched, once they got close enough to the monolith, it roared another call, this time releasing an EMP blast, completely knocking the vehicles out in the vicinity. Finally, long-distance rockets were fired and struck the creature. damaged, it regenerated at great speed, and resumed its stance unscathed. Eventually, the area has been fenced off and is now restricted to all. Ever since, the monolith stand silently. Now only a grand spectacle of awe and mystery, only adding more questions to these meat beings. And finally, the last creature on this list is...
and majestic world that exists today, it's as extraordinary to have such strange and mysterious beings appear all around us. Thank you for joining us on this journey of exploration and discovery of the lives of these living meat creatures.